Great to be with you. Um, it's a pleasure to join you for the third annual uh, Economic Development Summit. I think I've been uh, was here for the for the first two as well, and they uh, certainly stimulated some um, excellent discussions uh, about local economic development, about housing and infrastructure, both uh, opportunities and uh, challenges. And I'm sure that tonight's uh, reimagining of the Eastern Gateway section of the town you know, promises to be uh, similarly productive. Um, Reading's uh, state legislative delegation, which uh, includes um, House Minority Leader Brad Jones and Representative Rich Haggerty and myself, are very committed to partnering with um, our town leaders, uh, local businesses, developers, and residents to support and promote local economic development initiatives. Um, on behalf of Representative Jones and Haggerty, I know they both uh, would like to be here with us tonight. Um, the House of Representatives is in session, uh, actually uh, debating um, a very important uh, school funding bill, uh, which was passed by the Senate a few weeks ago. And Hopefully, when we pass by the, the house today, and that is important, uh, separate topic, but very important for Reading Public Schools and other public schools in our state. Um, as I'm sure you'd agree, we're we're very fortunate that the Greater Boston economy has been uh, strong uh, for the past at least the past decade now, and that has created many new business and job opportunities, and it has added to the region's uh, economic, uh, social, and cultural appeal. With the looming retirement of the baby boomers, however, our economic future depends on attracting and retaining more young workers. According to projections by the uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, we will need more than 400,000 new housing units, 400,000, to be built uh, over the next 20 years to keep up with uh, workforce needs in the greater Boston area. While economic growth uh, certainly brings uh, uh, many benefits with it, it also, uh, as you, we well know, puts significant pressures on our suburban communities like Reading. Um, and we can just touch on what some of these pressures are. I'm sure they'll be very familiar to all of you. Uh, a tight housing supply you know, has led to high home prices and high rents and uh, a lack of affordable housing for low and middle income families and, uh, and for seniors in, a, in our area. Heavily congested roads. Uh, I'm sure um, many of you uh, took uh, longer to get get here tonight um, than than you would like, um, because we have we are facing um, congestion as well as um, inadequate uh, public transportation makes it increasingly difficult for people to get to work, to school, medical appointments, and other activities of daily life. Um, also, we see greater demand for municipal services, particularly our schools as uh, school enrollment grows. And finally, uh, we face other um, economic growth leads to other infrastructure pressures, such as uh, ensuring that we have safe and reliable water, sewer, electric, gas uh, lines, and, and other infrastructure. So at the state level, uh, there's no question that we have our work uh, cut out for us to come up with um, solutions that can help uh, mitigate these, uh, these impacts and these challenges that come along with uh, the benefits of economic growth. Um, we are close, as I just mentioned a moment ago, to completing work on um, uh, major education funding reform, and that is designed to ensure adequate and equitable funding um, for our public schools. And, and public school funding, known as Chapter 78, is the biggest source of local aid that the state provides to uh, Reading and all of our uh, communities uh, every year. So it's really critical to local uh, um, budgets and, and finances. I'm also um, uh, um, optimistic that the um, during the current legislative session that the legislature, working uh, closely with Governor Baker, is going to do more to tackle both our housing and our transportation challenges. Um, there is a 
lot that we have been doing over the last few years, um, but we know we have to have to do more, um, both around um, affordable housing uh, initiatives and, of course, improving um, public transportation, including the commuter rail, and uh, strategies to try to uh, mitigate the congestion on our roads and our, our transportation infrastructure. But, um, of course, it's at the municipal level that the rubber really meets the road. Um, while there are no easy answers in how to balance these different pressures, both and, and as well as opportunities and challenges, um, I do think that Reading uh, provides a great example of thoughtful and collaborative planning. Um, and that really is a model for, um, for other communities uh, as well. The town's uh, economic development action plan, um, which was um, completed back in 2015, um, I think lays out a very comprehensive vision and plan for economic development, uh, housing, and uh, infrastructure. Um, in uh, my view, the town, and I'm sure many of you agree, the town has already made excellent progress uh, implementing aspects of this plan. Um, for example, I think Reading has done a great job in the downtown area embracing smart growth policies um, like Chapter 40R that encourage uh, mixed-use development and include some affordable housing and take advantage, of course, of the proximity to the uh, commuter rail station. Um, so it provides more housing opportunities for young families, for seniors. It's good for our local businesses because people are able to shop and eat, you know, right, uh, shop and dine where they're working. And of course, because you have proximity to public transportation, doesn't add as many uh, more cars uh, on the road. So that's exactly the kind of smart transit-oriented development that we're trying to create statewide. And I think Reading's done a really good job of, uh, of that, kind, that kind of development. Never easy, brings challenges with it, but I think it's the right direction to go. So the Eastern Gateway area is the next frontier, and that's why I think tonight's conversation is so important. Um, this conversation and others that will follow from it will help shape smart development decisions that will benefit Reading and I think the entire region. And I look forward uh, to joining you in listening tonight and learning from all of you. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for being here. I know we have municipal officials in the room. Uh, we have um, uh, local developers. We have residents. Um, we have a, a wide range of, of, of people and that's important to have different voices and perspectives in the conversation. So I just want to wrap up by um, putting in a, uh, a public uh, service announcement for a, um, an event that I'm actually going to be uh, sponsoring next Tuesday night in the very same room uh, on uh, climate change. And uh, that's another aspect of this whole discussion as well, how we become more resilient in dealing with the impacts of climate change. We have to always be thinking about that as well. So next Tuesday night, I'm hosting a conversation here focusing on um, new technology and new strategies for mitigating the impacts of climate change. And we've got a great panel of speakers. It's going to be right here at the library in this very room uh, next Tuesday night. So hope to see you then. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to be with you and share a few words. Uh, thank you, Senator. And next I'd like to welcome Select Board Member Mark Doxer to say <coughs> Hi folks, uh, my name is Mark Doxer. I am a member of the select board here in Reading and I want to welcome you all to, to this meeting tonight. I asked uh, Bob and the staff if I could just speak for a, a moment, literally, and talk a little bit about how excited we are at looking at new opportunities in town for economic development. One of the key things um, that we're trying to do um, on the board is to talk about an opportunity to create a new economic development committee. And what I'd like to, uh, we're working through that on the board now, I'd like to encourage folks who are interested to uh, consider participating with us, either on that in that group, uh, assuming that that gets formed soon, or other activities uh, around town. This is a really good opportunity for us. Um, there's a very exciting presentation that will come tonight. We got a preview at our last select board meeting. Um, but this is some really exciting activity in terms of what we could do and have some vision going forward for the town of Reading. Um, we also have some potential very interesting partners uh, in the RMLD uh, and other parts of the town that can really make this a, an amazing opportunity. So with that, I thank you very much and uh, enjoy the evening.
Uh, thank you, Mark. I'd like to stress, start by asking a couple questions. How many mem uh, members of the audience have been to one or more of the previous uh, economic development summits? I'm, I'm glad you're back, but I'm equally glad that there's a lot of new people in the room. Um, I go to a fair amount of night meetings, and I have to tell you one of the happiest parts about that is when I see people I don't recognize. Um, we really do appreciate you coming out. Um, economic development and planning is something that was new to me when I started. I, I worked in a, what I call a sensible job in the private sector before I came here. Um, I was a money manager, and to me, planning was maybe as long as an hour staring at eight screens. So when I got here and I met actual planners, I had to really shake my head a few times and say, 15 years? 10 years? Um, but a lot of what you see in the downtown has been 10 years in the works. So meetings like this are very important. The results of meetings like this will not be immediate. It will take a few years at the fastest. Um, but I encourage you, um, one thing Reading is very good at is reaching out to all participants and welcoming your input. So again, there'll be a presentation tonight I think you'll be very excited about. Um, at any time over the next few years, please feel free to contact us in town hall for any reason at all. And with that, I'd like to introduce Assistant Town Manager Gene Delliance. <coughs> Thank you, and I, again, want to echo everyone's uh, sentiments, saying thank you to everyone for coming tonight. I know this is such a busy time of year, and we really appreciate it. Um, tonight, we're going to really dig, dig into this idea of reimagining the Eastern Gateway, and I'm very excited to be able to unveil this idea that we've spent a fair amount of time on and, and now have some things to share. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been here in town working in Reading for 10 years, but I've spent my whole career in planning and community development. So I'm very excited uh, to be actively involved in this effort. Um, I also want to recognize the planning and community development staff. Uh, Julie Mercier is the Community Development Director. Aaron Schaefer is our Economic Development Director. Jesse Wyman is our Economic Development Liaison. And Andrew McNichol is our Staff Planner. And last but certainly not least, uh, I just noticed we had a few more folks come in. Uh, Andrew's in the back. Um, I also want to recognize Steve Sadwick, who's a longstanding colleague of mine uh, that lives in town but works for the town of Tewksbury. But Steve and I are working together for years. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's the team that we have, and Steve is our representative to MAPC, so that's really been great too. Um, that's the team, and, and, and we work very collaboratively. Um, the, the other component of what we do in planning is public participation and stakeholder involvement. And I see a couple folks in the audience from the stakeholders that represent the property owners in the area that you're going to see. Um, so if a couple of you guys could just raise your hands, um, thank you for coming. Uh, we have spent a lot of time with the property owners, and, and this is the area that we're calling the yard, and it's that area behind RMLD. Um, and we've, we've had a lot of really really great conversations with them uh, to bring them in early on uh, on some of the ideas that we're thinking about. But tonight, we're really here to hear from you. And um, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, I could go on and on and on about how much I love writing and planning and all the stuff that we do here. But I think I'll end it there and just um, say that um, I, I hope you can hang in there for the presentations. We're going to probably take about an hour with our consultant team, David Gamble, and um, our other team, uh, Green International. They're going to talk about um, some of the urban design concepts, and then Green is going to talk about some of the uh, transportation issues that we've been studying. Um, and many of the people here from the Eaton Lakeview neighborhood, please raise your hand. Thank you for coming. I spent oh, the better part of a year and a half with you people at meetings, so it's always great to see you in a much more friendly environment. Um, those meetings were long and painful, and it's great to be talking about positive outcomes, which we're so thrilled to have the neighborhood involved, in, especially in the work that Green's doing, so that we can really get a good picture of what's going on in transportation in that area. So thank you, and I'm going to invite Aaron up to introduce the team. Hi, 
and logging in here. Well, I'll get there in a second. Anyway, hello everyone. My name is Erin Schaefer. I'm the new Economic Development Director for the Town of Reading. Could you please use the microphone? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, hello everyone. My name is Erin Schaefer. I'm the new Economic Development Director for the Town of Reading. I came here by way of the city of Salem, and I still am a resident in Salem. Uh, many of you have probably read the article that came out um, not that long ago last week um, for more information on our initiatives. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that it's incredibly important to provide information and feedback and conversation. All the words that you provide to the town and among yourselves really drive our community. Um, I can't even stress that enough. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, the focus is, this evening is to imagine what could be in the Eastern Gateway. And the Eastern Gateway was identified as an economic development priority that was mentioned um, earlier um, as part of our economic development action plan. So that plan was developed in 2015 and it was meant to move us forward through 2022. Um, recommendations from this town plan regarding future planning and economic development initiatives in the Eastern Gateway include adopting local policies and practices that will facilitate compact development and mixed use in transit accessible areas, enhancing walkability and connectivity within and between priority development areas, that includes downtown and the Eastern Gateway, building community and activating public spaces through cultural, economic development, and placemaking initiatives, attracting and retaining existing local businesses, and branding and marketing Reading to attract new investment and customers. And I wanted to say all of those bullet points to you because those are um, the bits of information that we gathered from you years ago that we continue to move forward with. And um, what you'll see tonight is just a next step in the iterative process of planning and community development overall. And again, your comments for this evening are incredibly important and we continue to reach out um, to the public to continue this engagement and conversation. And so for tonight, we're really looking forward to reimagining what might be possible and no ideas are too big. So um, feel free to really imagine what could be. Um, tonight we have David Gamble from Gamble Associates who will be um, showing you what could be possible. There are lots of examples out there that I know that many of you have experienced in other cities and towns. Um, and this is really um, uh, quite a nice presentation of uh, not only information but just conceptual ideas and that, what, that is what tonight is really about. And then as a result of um, the 40B process with Eaton Lakeview, and I know many of you um, were here uh, and commented on that, I again can't tell you how important public engagement is in a variety of different ways. As a result of that process and project, we have consultants here, um, Green International Associates, who are here to talk about overarching uh, an overarching summary of the work that they are continuing to do and are in process. And then at the end of the evening, um, after our presentations, we have boards around the room and um, all of our staff are available and we will be um, having uh, more of a conversation for all of you to engage in different ways with our staff around the room. And again, that's an opportunity to provide feedback um, in a framework of a SWOT analysis for some of you who are technical. Um, but we are open again to all ideas and possibilities um, and we're here to listen to you tonight and continue to listen moving forward. So thank you for being here. And with that, David Gamble and I'll pull out the presentation well, real quick. And, uh, sorry. Sorry that up. I want to manage your expectations. I'm not going to lecture for an hour, so that's a good thing. And you may have to get home for a trick-or-treaters, which I saw on the way here. And I wanted to echo the comments that the senator made, that the notion that investment in infrastructure, economic development, thank you, Aaron, Transit, open space, and housing, these things are actually integrated. They're integral to one another. They impact one another. If you invest in infrastructure, it catalyzes development. It should be near transit. So those things are important to get them in a close alignment as possible. 
Uh, the second thing that I want to contradict is I'm not really unveiling a plan. So if you came here to see a large-scale master plan that's uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet, I'm going to disappoint you. What we actually feel that we're doing, can you hear me in the back? I feel more comfortable than behind the mic, is that okay? Uh, is channeling conversations that have been incubating for quite a while. And how that might come down to ground on an area that's actually fairly unremarkable as a place. Not as a place of business, because there are businesses near the light department building, functioning, successful, we want them to succeed, but that is a place as a destination. And how might Reading capitalize on that and think about growing in an incremental way over time that might help you to begin to think differently about that location? And actually, as uh, someone from outside, so I'm an architect and an urban planner, our, our uh, Cambridge-based offices focuses on neighborhood revitalization. There's a lot of great things in this area, and sometimes it's helpful to come out from the outside and, and actually appreciate things that you may not necessarily feel are so precious when you see them every day. So we are talking about a fairly small geography. And uh, Gene mentioned it's called the yard, and for no other reason than the RMLD needs another name. So <laughs> we had to think of something. The name has to come down the road. But all over the country, towns and cities are actually trying to figure out what makes them distinctive, what makes them unique, what are their assets that they can capitalize on, how can you compete, sorry Steve, against Tewksbury, how can you get economic development in places that make sense, and why should that take place? And what we're finding is actually a lot of these places are not along the main streets, although there is development along Main Street. They happen to be taking place in the residual, almost industrial or formerly industrial areas that don't necessarily seem like they're poised for transformation, but because of their proximity to things like transit, open space, maybe existing neighborhoods, they become more valuable. So what exactly is Reading's opportunity here, uh, and this is the geography that we're talking about. Is it possible to dim the lights yeah, just on the front? Yeah. If we could? You should, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, here's Town Hall. So here's Ash, Ash Street right here. Uh, that's a fairly small geography. It was identified previously in the Economic Development Plan as a priority area. So our firm was hired to try to look at that and think about its transformation. The commuter rail it's just going to get more and more important over time. Communities are recognizing the value of public transit, especially commuter rail, uh, and you're seeing evidence of that uh, with the redevelopment that's happening around the station. There are, thank you very much, there are a lot of fragile wetlands, actually, that are channelized and you actually can't see them because it's, it's managed through more traditional infrastructure here, uh, culverts, things like that, but this is, this is an area that floods, as you may be familiar with. Are there any residents of Ash Street along, uh, raise your hand. Okay, so five, six, great, thank you for coming. Uh, so there's implications for sustainability. You mentioned resiliency is another one of these overlapping themes. And then the light department building and, and the town yard. We are working in Andover, which if you may be familiar with, has a commuter rail station right in the most unremarkable place of their town, uh, the town yard. And after 20 years, I think they finally developed the courage to build a new town yard so that that site on the transit line could be redeveloped and become not a new downtown, but grow their downtown. So what we want to talk about tonight is how might you grow this area, this grow this area that complements the development that you have elsewhere. So it really falls into these four categories that we think are we're most optimistic about transformation. You've got the transit. Uh, it's this area that has businesses, but maybe could be better utilized in terms of the uh, industry. That actually that character that what's the best word? Uh, gritty character is kind of a cool places that people like to go to. That's where you're seeing the, the, the brew pubs, uh, the uh, fitness centers, things that have some character and some distinctiveness. It actually, there are some artifacts in this area that are kind of cool and could be reused. The open space networks and the corridors. So 
all across the Commonwealth and across the U.S., you're seeing investment happening directly adjacent to transit. Now, this may not be exactly comparable to you because this is a streetcar in Oregon. You, you can't take a bad picture of public transit in Oregon. I'm sorry, just everything uh, works so seamless. And that's the other point we want to talk about, which is investment in the public realm, which is a real yawner, right? The right of way, streets, sidewalks, street trees, canopies, rain gardens, that can be done with design excellence. That can be a superlative public realm that catalyzes redevelopment on its edges, and that's really what's remarkable about that image in Oregon. And thinking about, dare I say, higher density, closer to transit, is actually where that affordable housing could be subsidized. So in order to get more people to live down here, you actually have to think and allow a slightly greater density that could be mitigated in its relationship to the beautiful single family homes on Ash Street. There are ways, there are design ways in which you can mitigate scale to allow for some greater density in return for perhaps a better public realm. And that's where the negotiation happens. So uh, lots, there's you know, so many different examples of, of capitalizing on transit and we think this area should not relocate the station because that would siphon away activity that's happening where it is now, but make a better connection to that transit station through bike trails and walking paths and a more landscape buffer, and that is possible. The second theme, uh, uh, Aaron actually called our attention. How many have been to Asheville? Did you like it? Loved it. Why? Um, because um, you could eat, you could listen to music, you can meet all different kinds of people, and you know, five minutes away, you have most beautiful mountains. Okay, so it's diverse, uh, cool, funky. Would someone else have their hand up? Have you been there, sir? Yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's kind of neat because, uh, as you say, they repurpose uh, um, historic or old buildings into things that are active art. They, they took an old Woolworths and made it into an art gallery. I mean, who does that? Right. I would say proactive municipalities yeah. and interested passionate citizens and we know that Reading has a active arts community here and boy wouldn't it be great to find a way to imprint that on this on this former industrial area uh, so there's a million photographs like this but look that's just paint on an old brick or block building but it helps you to think differently about the place and we think that could actually happen here uh, my I live in Watertown the Arsenal Center for the Arts has this tiny little quarter acre green space that's filled with farmers markets and events and, and the arts actually flow out into the yard and boy wouldn't it be great if your existing arts had a better presence in the community not reflecting the arts but actually expressing it and we think that you should harness that you should capitalize on it these older buildings are perfectly situated for different types of uses that can be many different things and we know that there are existing businesses in these buildings, but just think about how many different types of activities can happen in an old rehab industrial building. It's almost limitless, and that's one of the allure of them, as well as the fact that their large scale can be subdivided. So you may not remember or be aware that MAPC did a study for this area a few years ago uh, in which they were thinking that maybe it's more of a clean slate. So our bias here tonight is to actually say, you don't have to demolish what's there. Think about a way to grow it in a more organic fashion that's more nimble, economically viable. The rest of the uh, people who own these businesses can participate in the redevelopment or not. That is a more viable economic development strategy. We think it's something that you have as a strength here, not as a, as a liability. So that might be too heroic of an image. Uh, but walking through some of those buildings, they're quite impressionable. and. Could they be a climbing gym? Could they be other things uh, uh, over time? We do a lot of work along trails, the Atlanta Beltline here in, in Michigan, uh, and it's really just another one of these seemingly unimportant uh, pedestrian links that, uh, thanks, uh, this is along Michigan. Trails are more and more important because if you did come by car and you're stuck in traffic, can you just walk there if it's a better better route? So 
pathways, bike trails, uh, also in a relationship to these old uh, buildings. I mean, who doesn't like sausage, bacon, and beer, right, <laughs> on an old industrial building? Uh, here along the Atlanta Beltline, which was a former industrial corridor, now it's a bike path, and it will soon be a public transit corridor right of way. Uh, you're seeing these old funky buildings just be rehabbed. Um, so, uh, again, there's this is all, uh, like, Architecture porn. <laughs> I don't know how to call it. Be cool buildings that are funky with different uses and, and draw. Here is, in fact, a rock climbing gym in one of these big buildings. So capitalize on that. Harness it. Channel it and give it an identity. Uh, the open spaces. Every community is trying to find a way to make that more viable as a, as a catalyst. And parks, waterways are, are catalysts for their surroundings. Sorry, we're slightly uh, off kilter here. So think about trails. Think about using that as a way to grow your downtown. Uh, and it might just be an eight-foot pathway like this, or it could become, become an identity for the district. It could start to, to, to bring people, to draw people in, especially in its relationship to the, the uh, bike path, uh, the, the train line. This is a work project we did in Buffalo, New York, which was essentially a 22-foot right-of-way that uh, had a very distinctive identity. And this right-of-way had unique paving and lighting and trees and landscape, and it actually pulled together disparate buildings, buildings that were separated from one, one another, into a, an axis, like a line, and that, that became a linear park. Like, could something like that exist in, in the yard? We think yes. So I was just in, the, in Chicago looking at this. Again, there's so many different examples of this. And you have it here. It's not visible. It might not be branded. It may not be something that people think about, but you can build on that, and we'll show you where that can occur. And then lastly, <coughs> pardon me, the, maybe the most important in terms of resiliency, but also the, the hardest to get your mind around, is how to, to take the, the waterways and let them become more significant, not just channelize them, but, but harness them and think about them as a way in which your office parks could have a stronger presence together or in terms of a, the relationship to one another. Uh, and this is actually in Reading, uh, Reading, UK, <laughs> but but that scale of development is possible, and we work a lot with Weston and Samson, and I think just opened up their corporate headquarters uh, right here, and boy, they know what they're doing in terms of finding ways in, to get these landscapes to work. So that's the, uh, let's say, the good things, and yet it obviously ain't that simple, right? There's a lot of challenges here, and let's just talk about those. So. Uh, there, I have not worked in a community in 20 years where abutting residents didn't feel that they were entitled to some special consideration because of the development that was happening next to them was impacting them more severely than others that were outside of that trajectory. That's just, that's just the way it is. So the benefits are diffuse and general, but the impacts tend to be pronounced and very specific. So that negotiation between the backs of the houses on Ash Street and what happens in this yard matters a lot and it can be designed and it can be done well and it can be done poorly but that demands that where new development happens is thinking about the impacts uh, to abutters. There is a balance between the surface parking that's required for development and this negotiation with a performative landscape, a landscape that actually can do more than just be a pretty place. It actually helps to deal with stormwater. The scale dis discrepancies, and then there are multiple landowners here. And as a planner, we get to draw on other people's properties. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, and and uh, for, unfortunately, you guys have to bear the brunt of that. But we have had conversations with the property owners. And we are trying to think about how might they work a little bit more collaboratively in envisioning the transformation of this area over time. So I'd like you to entertain two very different notions here. One is that... Planning matters, and you've done that, but also people get planning fatigue. I'm surprised that there's this turnout tonight, <laughs> so people get tired of planning. So that's one dilemma. And the other one is, 
you have to think bold and get excited about this, but it also needs to happen in a very incremental way. So moving incrementally and judiciously towards a bigger vision is also along a spectrum, and that's where we'd like to try to push you. So you're getting larger scale development where you should, frankly, near the transit station. Um, and then the natural systems here. Oopsie. I'm sure you don't want me to go back. <laughs> uh, the natural systems, which are a little bit hard to see, but could be strengthened. Uh, I actually think there may be people that disagree with me. I think that's a pretty good building in terms of uh, addressing scale. There are setbacks. This is in your downtown. I can't remember the name of it. Sorry. It's a better color than when I saw it last time. I can't tell you that. Uh, setbacks. There are some ground floor retail. That's a mixed use. There's housing. I think that's a good project. You should try to do more of it. I know that this building, which I passed along Main Street, was also met with some community concern about the uh, scale of it. but. Scale matters, density matters, and in some cases the cost of development just requires a little bit more scale than people want to tolerate. And that's why, in this case, along a main street, it actually should happen here if the uses are appropriate, and I would say, I would think that they are. Uh, this is a view of that area, which you probably may not have seen, but so here's the knife sharpening business, what's the name? Northeast. Northeast. <laughs> Sorry. Are they here tonight? Yes. Hey, greetings. Uh, hey, welcome. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I'm going to talk about your building tonight. I hope that's all right. Uh, so you can't get there from here. That's the problem. Uh, the first few times we came here, we were confronted with a lot of turnarounds and parking lots. And so there's no continuity. There's actually no place. There's no there there, as they like to say, uh, because it's never envisioned to be a, a public place. It's a, it's a place of industry. It's a place of uh, uh, of economy. So just imagine, uh, and sorry about this, uh, we know that, Aaron, that there's this survey that's out, and we hope that you join it. It's closed, it's closed and we've had some really good responses, 1,500, over 1,500. 1,500 responses, if you haven't done this, it's already closed, so it's too late, but we can write comments tonight, right? So that was just one way to channel the engagement, but just, again, thinking long term, Maybe not even within your lifetime, David. Sorry. Uh, he, <laughs> he wasn't listening. Uh, think about this is a remarkable building. It's underutilized. Uh, I, I understand there may be contamination issues that one has to figure out. But imagine that uh, you thought about that as an asset that could be capitalized on in terms of a view corridor. And what we're trying to do is actually insert a road through this site that provides addresses for the businesses and the properties that align along it. So you can't do that now because there's no road there, but a public right-of-way that's not necessarily a thoroughfare or a racetrack, but is a call, we call it a shared street where bikes, pedestrians, and people are thought about as being able to share that. Um, how might something like this begin to transform or even work with the existing businesses in trying to make that a more impressionable place and also a place that you can get to? Because right now, it's not possible. So I see some stairs in the audience like you can't quite figure out what we're suggesting. I'll show you on a site plan, but what we want, what we want to emphasize is there's assets here, there's historic assets even, that can be, uh, that can be linked and connected. Uh, so this is the front of that building, and uh, we want to go out on a limb and say that's where your art, your art, uh, art, center. art center should go. Yeah. Uh, there's no reason why that building shouldn't actually. Did it? Did they pave the surface lot in front of it? <laughs> Okay, so the construction vehicles you see are not to do this. It's to <laughs> repave the parking lot. But imagine if, in fact, it was a landscape that, like the Watertown Arts Center, was a place of congregation, of performances, not ruckus beer garden things, but art opportunities and uh, reusing this fairly modest scale building but gives a presence to your art center. We think it doesn't have to be the art center. It could be a dozen other things, but it should be a civic use. You should rehab that, and it should have an appropriate buffer uh, to the residents. And that, that to us seems like a, a, like a, a very good step. Uh, this is a view up Ash Street, and so here it is in this location. Uh, 
we think that that space that we just showed could have housing on either side. So maybe three stories, uh, which if you're this abutter might seem like it's looming over top of you. Uh, it would depend in a hundred different ways about how that gets configured and what the materials are and what the uses are. But we think Ash Street is uh, an underutilized asset as you get to this area and wouldn't it be great if you just started with a little park and you tried to get some uses there. If that's all that happened in five years, that would be a huge success really. Uh, just do that and people will think about this area differently. It's not that this area is that far away. We could walk there probably in about 12 minutes. It just seems like that distance is immense because it's not a path that you would tend to take. You'd have to cross, first of all, the worst intersection I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> at the rail, and that's got to be fixed, right? But it, part of it is just how do you create a stronger sense of connectivity that makes it seem closer than it is and encourages people to walk from one to the other. So uh, we think, you know, this may be too, too large, and we understand that, but it should be, this space should be defined by other uses. So planners rely too much on plans. That's why we wanted to start with those perspectives. But if we think a little bit about, uh, about looking at it in, in the ground plane. So here we are again. And by the way, the geography could be much, much larger. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. So here's that historic building, right? Uh, Town yard. This is that view that I showed previously where the parking lot dead ends, um, northeast, right? Um, here's that worst intersection in the world. So, interestingly enough, uh, we discovered that in fact there is a right of way that in this magenta color, which is essentially a, uh, what's the gene, what's the best term? It's a, uh, easement, right? So that, that exists, but of course no one would ever think of that as a, as a valuable piece of real estate. But So what we're suggesting is could you straighten that out and connect it to here? Uh, so as highway budgets go, it would be a rounding error uh, to think about what might be a 400 foot long uh, axis here that connects to that. But if you did that, and if we looked at the specific property lines, knowing that that's a successful electric business and you guys got uses in here, and uh, uh, if we thought about, so Pond Meadow Drive, and here's, this has got to be resolved, that the uses between the light industrial and the office and the, and the municipal, if that's what exists now. And Andrew, how did you like? Uh, you use the arrows <laughs> on this bottom. Oh, good, good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yep. That's better. Sorry about the technological. Uh, uh, so what we'd like to see is a more hybridized sense of uses where the residential could coexist with uh, the open space, could coexist with the municipal, if that's an arts or, or, or public facility. So going from here, where it's zoned, to something here, which is more hybridized. Zoning is a very crude and inefficient tool to create the types of places that we all enjoy. In most cases, zoning was created to separate uses, right? But it's the spaces and the places that actually combine uses that we love to be in, right? So how can you zone, how can you anticipate this in a way that allows for that to happen? So here's a diagram of the paths um, has everyone been back here? Has anyone not been here? Okay, so it's probably hard to imagine, but what you're seeing are a lot of tractor trailers, you know, in storage, and, and again, I'm not dissing on the uses. I'm just saying it's not a place that you would go to unless you had a reason to go. Uh, Where's the knife sharpening? The knife is right here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did you bring them tonight? Okay. Uh, maker spaces. That's what everyone talks. That's what those millennials talk about, right? Uh, maker spaces where you can build stuff. Uh, so what we think of a good first spot uh, and a developer, if the, those of you in the audience, this would probably be a good place to start because here's the dentist's office. The transit line is right there. If one thought about this as a place of significance, you could define that and get some residential on its edges. That would actually create a really nice quad, if you want to call it that, with parking in the back. Uh, with a little um, 
I don't want to say quid pro quo because that's such a charged term now. <laughs> With a little transfer of property, uh, if, if the Northeast Cutlery could sort of build an addition that I think they'd like to do over here and as return they give up that little piece of real estate, then you could start to extend Ponte Meadow Drive and provide that axis and that alignment to the turret of the uh, like department building. That's what we're, if you could do this in 10 years, that would be a huge thing because now people would say, oh, you can get there by here, you can you know, maybe get there by here, uh, maybe there's not access onto Ash Street, but that, that move is really important and what that does is it gives an address now actually to these businesses uh, that they didn't have previously. And there's certainly lots of complications with where service goes and things like that, but it, it's possible. That's what we want to suggest. It's possible to think about it in that way. Uh, then this notion of capitalizing on the hydrology and thinking about the water bodies that go through here. This is actually a pretty nice office building and it's surrounded by the weeds. And if you think about that as a water course and you try to channelize the geography and you thought about that as a way uh, in the town yard, if that were to relocate and you thought about essentially a few more um, office buildings. Here's Fran. F Fran. Friends, uh, uh, with maybe a little addition that would start to define that street, you could have a turnaround here. So, what we're showing are streets, but they're not again thoroughfares. The idea is these are access points. They're shared streets. They're uh, they're they're uh, taking advantage of bikes and, and and paths. And maybe our transportation colleagues can talk a little bit about that. So, over time. Uh, could one begin to think about a more comprehensive circulation pattern? And when urban designers talk about connectivity, residents are going to see traffic, <laughs> right? Uh, however, with more connectivity, there's more opportunities to circulate and traffic can be diminished. I'm not ready to fight that battle now because this scheme could move forward even in the absence of having these be roads. These could just be plaza and you turn around here. That would be a pretty good compromise. But but uh, the open space then could be seen as a little bit more a part of the downtown fabric. Uh, here's the land uses, yellow residential, the magenta is purple is like a civic or arts related. Um, uh, this, is, this is industrial, uh, also commercial could be industrial office here, but really trying to get a more uh, hybridized sense of the uses with the water course running through. and. Uh, Parking in the back, you know, we have to have service parking, but does it always have to be in our face? Does it have to be right there? Um, our answer is no. Uh, think about smaller distributed parking lots as opposed to large, big ones like you have at the, at the grocery stores. And this is where, you know, maybe this is a better solution. Uh, Bob, the town manager, talked about, well, what's important here is this. And maybe the circulation patterns sort of recognize that and, and bring you to the backside without going through. So uh, it was Aaron's idea to think about a name for this. So we said the yard only because that's what we termed the one in Andover. <laughs> and we were like, well, let's just do that because maybe you guys do it first. Uh, but a place of makers, a place of industry, there's so much branding opportunity uh, that, that, that you could start to think about this place differently. Here is a uh, the previous plan, and it's unethical for a one er, planner to criticize another planner's work, and I don't want to do that, but I do want to say the vision of large new buildings surrounded by a sea of parking is not something I think is appropriate here. I do think it makes a lot of sense to put housing along Ash Street, and they showed it a little smaller than we did, but that's okay. Uh, the developers and the community will figure that out, but the notion that you have residential along Ash and other transformative uses here makes, makes a good deal of sense. And we are not... Uh, this is not our idea, frankly. What we're doing is synthesizing things that we've read and the plans that you've done and thought about how it comes down to ground in a very specific place. Uh, so he here we're talking about this area. If one was really ambitious, you'd take on this whole, whole transformation, uh, but that's, that's a 
multi-generational ambition. Start small, build on your assets, make judicious decisions that over time can build and incrementally create a new destination. We think you're well positioned for that. Uh, there's reports in terms of your DPW facility. Uh, we know the corridor study is underway, the transportation study. And we, we're actually doing this n near Dayton. I'll be there tomorrow. This is the canal corridor, the Miami and Erie Canal used to connect Cincinnati to Toledo, but this is a canal corridor. These are older industrial buildings. You want to just, people want to demolish them. Well, why not, you know, turn those into small incubator space, fabrication, arts, 300 square feet here, 500 square feet there. Things that you can bring businesses in that are an easier economic lift. And then in aggregate, they begin to create stronger synergies than if they're separated. So we know that you've got a lot of interesting uh, businesses here. Could you start to think about that in one or two of these buildings? Like this one. Is this property owner here? <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> with, some, with some transformations, uh, maybe public access here, uh, front doors, trellises, gardens. Uh, does it always have to be asphalt? Does it have to be service parking? Maybe one end of the building, you get a tenant that could do a rock climbing gym, but just something to get people there. Uh, in fact, there's a gold's gym over here. Why don't they move over here? Uh, so that's just a cartoon to suggest that. Here's um, the brothers, the knife brothers. Others? Oh, no. oh no, okay, sorry. Okay, uh, that's not theirs, but that's also the previous owners, right? Yeah. Yeah. See how naive I am? We're just like, our ideas on different people's properties, but, you know, add a, add a trellis, um, you know, this could be a great little cafe, it could be a maker space, um, some modest landscaping, so it's not 100% impervious surfaces, water has somewhere to go. Uh, this is uh, another property, could you think about recladding it, some signage, so we're not talking, we're not putting the burden on the private sector to do this, but we do think with a public-private partnership, and that's what this has to be, there's synergies between investment in the public realm, that the public sector does well, and confidence in the private private sector that this area has value and it can grow over time. Uh, uh, this is, I think, your property, right? So I've got that one right. Um, I loved walking through your space because you see all these knives getting sharpened and it's cool and you should like celebrate that and there should be a big picture window and people can just look in there and see and you've got a cool neon sign and people are looking in there and seeing it. And wouldn't it be great? Imagine. Yeah, wouldn't it be great? Get a new sign up there and, and there's a platform and maybe the trucks don't pull here they pull here and that things like that if you had three or four of those I mean this place would just be super hot so uh, they can happen in these small areas maybe there's some new redevelopment um, Here's the alternative for those of you that were concerned about Ash Street traffic. So oh, as a planner, I would say make these one way. So you could come down here and do that, or you can do that. Now everyone's going to cut through to go to the highway, right? So maybe you don't do that, and maybe what you do is the Palm Meadow Drive comes here, and this is a plaza, and there's no way to circulate through there. So we don't want to hinge the success of this plan on a, a sort of circulation mobility concern that's frankly changing radically day by day almost and so you don't have to do that here but it would it would be it would be helpful uh, so with that uh, we really are bullish on what is other, otherwise seen as like your backside of the town we think that this area could be unique it could complement what you have there's so many assets and I'm glad that the town manager and Jean have really made an effort to engage in a dialogue so that you can begin to envision a future that's different than today thanks Yeah. And with that, I'd like to introduce Green International, and we're going to quickly change over our um, presentations here. Okay. You're good. Right. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, thank you, Aaron. Uh, my name is Swing Wong. I'm with Green International Affiliates. Uh, I have my colleague here, Samaya, Samaya as well. Uh, she's been helping me with the planning uh, aspects of it. Um, so before um, I dive in and explain what our involvement is, I'd uh, just like to give a little background history of how we got here. Um, about a year ago, we uh, were, um, were peer reviewers for the traffic study for the Lakeview uh, development. And as part of that uh, peer review process, we noted that the uh, Lakeview Ave and Walker's Brook intersection could use some mitigation as part of that project. Um, so we floated some ideas out there f to the developer and suggest that, hey, maybe you should take a look at a couple of ideas and see if those mitigations measures would work. Uh, for example, potentially restricting left turns coming out of Lakeview or signalizing the Lakeview Ave itself along with um, General Way. Um, however, um, once we floated that idea out there, what we heard from the community is that they really don't prefer just looking at an isolated intersection. They really want to look at more of a big picture um, of the area and how some of the improvements at this particular intersection tie in with the rest of the area. So that's um, kind of where we come in now. And after the peer review process, we work with the town's uh, planning staff and to refine a scope of work for us in our study areas. And uh, that's how we're here today. Quickly explaining a, a brief scope of work, uh, what we're actually signed on to do is develop some conceptual uh, level design that will meet the community and the town's goals and objectives uh, for the whole area. Um, some of these bullet points are the things that um, we do that will eventually get us there. At the end, what I like to think of ourselves as advisors. Um, we don't get to decide really what's best for you, right? Um, so we'll come up with the ideas for concept improvements. We'll let you know the pros and cons of each. And then at the end, um, help you decide what might be best for you. Um, so that's why I like to think of our involvement as um, this. Uh, in terms of the study area, uh, as some of you can see here on the map, uh, Walker's Brook. Here's the Lakeview um, 95. Um, so we extend, really expanded the study area quite a bit uh, since uh, the last time I was here. Uh, we're now including uh, Washington Street and Main Street uh, and the entire Walker's Brook uh, corridor, as well as John Street corridor, as well as the Ash Street corridor. And all those circles that you see are all the uh, intersections that we have collected traffic counts and will be do an analysis of the existing conditions, but also um, utilize that to test out some of the concepts that we have and uh, let you know again um, how they may that might pan out and uh, for you to decide. In addition to uh, just vehicles, we also look at connectivity for all users. Um, for example, part of our scope is going to be looking at how we're going to connect the downtown, the commuter rail station to Walker's Brook, to Lake Q, or to Ash Street. And although we are not working directly on the Eastern Gateway development, we are taking that into account and thinking about how connections to that uh, location in relation to the rest of the neighborhood within our study area. Uh, the next few slides, I'm just going to share some of the data collection that we have done uh, as part of our initial work. Uh, these are traffic count data that we collected back in September a month ago. Uh, these values here indicates the amount of uh, vehicles that travel on these roads uh, every day. Um, so Walker's Brook, uh, 24,000. Uh, that might not be a surprise to some of you. It is heavily traveled. Um, what actually did caught my eyes is John Street and the amount of traffic that is on John Street on a daily basis. Um, I did hear from the community during the peer review that John Street is being used as a cut through on a daily basis, uh, but I am even myself surprised how much. Um, and Washington Street carries about 8,000 and Ashton uh, another 3,000. Uh, in terms of crash um, summary, we do look at crash data as well. So it has part of our conceptual design. We also look at hey, what can we improve in terms of safety. We've had the number of crashes for a while now, but now that we have the counts, we are finally able to develop what we call a crash rate. Uh, that takes into account the amount of traffic coming into a certain location along with the number of crashes that actually occur. Um, that usually is a better indicator of whether or not a location um, has some safety safety issues or concerns. And we usually compare that rate with the state average. Um, 
again, probably no surprising, uh, not surprisingly, the Ash Street and Main Street, Washington Street and um, Main Street, as well as a couple on Walker's Brook, uh, shows up has above the average, so certainly indicating there's some um, safety concerns, and we have been looking at that, uh, taking that into account, so. Uh, we're also looking at pedestrians and bicyclists. Again, we're, we're trying to look at it, um, connectivity for all users and not just vehicles. Uh, we have identified locations where pedestrian um, crashes and bicycle crashes have happened within our area. The red dots are where pedestrian uh, crashes happen and the greens are the uh, bicycle. So there, there are some. So with that, um, at this time, I'd like to just kind of say that, you know, we completed a lot of our initial work um, on the fifth bullet here. We're about 95% done with identifying some ideas. Right now, we're actually working hard to come up with a way to present to the town staff in an efficient and effective way. Um, so we're looking forward to meeting with them soon and then uh, continue on to the next step uh, before we present that to the public. So um, with that, I guess I'll turn it back to Aaron. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, so now is the part where we're going to ask for your feedback. And um, the planning staff will be available at each of the um, boards. Um, before we do that, I didn't know where we have a little bit of extra time. So if there were any questions for our consultants, we can kind of squeeze that in now before we get to the, um, the really fun part of, of getting ideas from you folks. So I'm going to open it up just in case um, there are some questions out there that uh, since we have our consultants here, we'll, we'll be able to um, answer anything that might, might be out there. Yeah, I'd be interested in what the Ash Street residents have to say and some of their reactions. If I could just jump in on that too, um, when we wrote the economic development plan uh, back in 2015, um, we had a specific neighborhood meeting with the Ash Street neighbors. We sent the same mailing that we sent for this meeting. We had about 60 people there. Um, at, it was at RMLD. And we talked about the, uh, the genesis of all of this, uh, which is embedded in the economic development plan and this, this area of, of priority development that we had identified. And we got a lot of feedback at that point. Um, now fast forward to where we are today, and we definitely want to hear from the Ash Street neighbors. So thank you. Yeah, there are questions or comments? Do you have any uh, the average daily traffic from five year or ten years ago that you're doing a comparison with? Can you repeat the question? Uh, the question is, uh, do I have traffic counts from about five or ten years ago? Um, I got to take a look. I don't um, recall that right off the top of my head. Um, I believe there are some that's available on Walker's Brook, but I have to really dig through a look at it. Thank you. Um, as you know, we spent a lot of time working and, and redeveloping the downtown, and, and it's really taken off in a lot of ways. You saw a lot of the developments going on there, and this is really exciting to kind of sort of be as a next step, but um, have you given much thought either on the transportation side or even on the design side as you sort of figure out the yard? What's the best way to knit those two areas together? Because the way I would kind of look at it is that if that development, what you call the yard, you know, could happen even incrementally. I just consider that also the downtown. Yeah, sure. So how, how do we get people from point A to point B um, you know, so that it's just, I mean, I know that intersection is a big thing and, and, and that needs to get studied, but, um, you know, how do you envision, you know, the, the uses there and how you sort of kind of connect that all together? Because that's, a, you know, otherwise you just have two separate kind of pieces yeah. that, that don't connect and work well together. Give us a moment while we do some technical rearranging. So great question. I totally agree that this is part of your downtown, although few people would describe it in that way because it doesn't seem, it doesn't have the characteristics of your downtown. In terms of the, with the right of way, the south side of the tracks is actually 
harder to make that connection because there's a culvert, there's a grade change, so if we were to draw a line here, that's a little bit harder to do. It's easier on this side, so in terms of, it's a four minute, five minute walk probably from here to the train station, so we think this area together with some smart intersection design there might be one way to make that connection more obvious. You could easily get a 12 foot bike bike path in here along that edge. I don't know who uses that parking. Um, that would be one obvious way. We had gone so far early on to suggest that Ash Street should not continue through. We think that's a huge problem and it will always remain a problem. And if uh, you could, uh, we would suggest returning Ash Street to Maine making a signature park space here as an anchor to what you have at Town Hall and that those two anchors create a, bell, a barbell that grows your downtown in this direction. But we stopped short because there's, there's enough, uh, op enough opportunities, I wanted to say challenges here. But that would be one way to solve this problem and I feel like it's the distance is a lot closer than it seems because no one wants to make that walk because of the dangerous intersection, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, where Ash Street is, that's where Crippley Pizza is. Yeah. yeah. On the green. Over, over, slightly right, go right, go right, go right, go right, go right. Okay, you're projecting a driveway there because there's three houses now on Ash Street right there in front. Mm -hmm. There's already 3,000 cars there driving up and down Ash Street. It's a little difficult. I'm one of them. <laughs> sure. <laughs> She's yeah. one of them. Yeah. There's 3,000 cars going by every day. It's a little difficult sometimes to back out of a driveway. If we have more cars, the, be the area you're calling the yard looks beautiful. But now if there's 500 more cars, 1,000 more cars a day, I know those three houses don't want that. <laughs> Uh, good point. That is the location of the office currently, and office loads, the traffic generated for an office is much greater than a residential building, and the ratios of what you need for an office building are much, much greater than a residential building. So think about the utilization of this building currently versus a residential building that requires much, many fewer cars than that today. I'm just going to go back. To so those three people are essentially screwed? <laughs> Excuse my language. I'm just trying to go back to the existing. Uh, bear with me. It's not the traffic uh, because of the industrial area. It's the traffic that's going from Waste between Wakefield and Main Street and kind of cutting through yeah. to Market Basket and Stop and Shop and everything else. Yeah, that's yeah. It. But if we put the, the nice yard there, there's going to be a lot more traffic there. No. Right. Oh. Right. And there's three houses there. That You're talking about here? Yes. Or here? Right, yeah, right there. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. One house, two yeah. house, three yep. house. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is where the, again, the benefits are diffuse in general. This would be great for the town. The impacts are more pronounced, obviously, for those who are directly adjacent to it. But the point I was trying to make is, as an office building, you need three to five cars per thousand square feet to park it. For a residential building, you need one, maybe even less, relative to the transit for parking demands for a residential building. So if this were to change over time, this would generate fewer cars if it were residential than an office. Fewer cars parking, but not fewer cars on Ash Street because Ash Street, those cars are going to Wakefield. They're not going to that building. Yeah. So there's not that many cars sure. going to that building. So anyway, anyway that's... Look, valid, valid comment? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look, we're, you, know, you need to think beyond one site here. This is a big area. We're talking about a town transformation. I'm not diminishing the, the impacts, but let's think about the long-term transformation of this area over time and how to address any concerns that might arise, like traffic or like shadows or other things that obviously impact people adjacent to it. You had a blue line going around the backside on one of these slides. I don't remember what slide number it was. That would be beautiful. I agree. <laughs> Sorry. I think that was a bike path. Bike path, yeah. There's so many. We, we spend so m I spend all my time talking about parking and traffic, I swear to God. And I want to talk about open space and parks and livability and shared streets and things, but we all just give way too much attention to cars. I'm sorry. I think that counts matter, but let's think about this area beyond just impacts. Let's think about benefits. 
It doesn't impact you, it impacts me. <laughs> That's true. I'm going back to Watertown tonight. That's true, yes. Exactly. Okay. I'm going right there. Yeah. <laughs> Good. A comment in the back? Good. I'm just curious. Who develops this? It, the town says, we'd like to do this. Do you bring in a developer to... Or does a develop come in, developer come in and buy up everything and say, okay, the developer deals with the town? Who, where does it start? Does it, can a developer come in and buy up everything? That's a great question for a planner. This is just a concept. Okay. So um, there's nothing concrete. There's nothing cast in stone. We're reimagining this area. So the, the detail of, okay, well, who's going to develop what and how does it go, we don't know. So somebody said it would take five years just to get this one little... <laughs> I so, said it would be a success if in five years yeah. you do something. In I'm going to be years. more I, 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 as a consultant. I'll be more direct. I think you get a group of people together to figure out how to get that that building, that historic building, occupied for an arts-related use. That would be a good start. Who owns that building? Light department. The light, light department. department. So it's a privately owned building? No, public. 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 The Reading Municipal Light Department. Okay. Yeah. But simultaneously, I think the Northeast Cutlery guys figure out a way to maybe make this a better interface. Uh, we figure out a way to get 2,000 square feet of this space to be occupied. You proactively uh, meet with developers that do this type of work and get them to see a broader vision and maybe they start to invest. Who goes first is always the trickiest thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it could be something that we haven't even really spent that much time thinking about. You know, it could be um, maybe across the streets where um, the market basket is. Maybe something major happens there. Hey, build out, it's a great idea. But, but as the driver said, where do those cars go? Once they come in, they got to turn around and go back. Yeah, we, that's one of the details that we know we have to really spend a lot of time on, for sure, to get that right. Hi, <laughs> Dave Talbot, speaking as a resident, and uh, thank you very much for this very interesting plan. The one, one piece, and to, to Barry's point a minute ago, is how to knit these two areas together. I wonder if we could study the potential for a elevated walking and bike, bike path that goes roughly along the MBTA right away from the depot area to this area, which not only implicates this uh, general area that you're talking about, but getting the population to do uh, alternative ways of getting from the shopping areas to the depot area where there's hundreds of units of housing, relieving congestion in that overall, you know, Washington Street, Main Street intersection. And I think, you know, I'm down in Cape Cod where they have the elevated uh, bike bridges over, you know, like in Dennis and Yarmouth. I, think I looked up the DOT, they're like three or four million dollars for a, one of those really nice overhead that has a gradual ramp up and down, which is a lot, but is it really a lot in the long term to be able to really relieve the congestion, get people a different way, you have delivery services going from the shopping areas into the depot, people going from the offices getting to the train station other than by trying to navigate that intersection. So I just want to throw that, that concept out there, kind of building on what, what Barry said a minute ago, is how do we build, how do we get these two areas together? Thank you. I think we're really excited about everyone's ideas and idea concepts. So what's been presented here tonight is not a plan. I think that's really important to say to all of you. Um, it's really a conceptual idea, like a series of ideas. And you know, the idea of an elevated highway is something we want to hear about. Or the um, bike, or bike path idea. is what I meant. Um, I think of it as a multi-use path. There are different ways of being able to talk about the same things. And you know, I, I think, um, so as we move into our breakout groups, like this is really an opportunity to propose all those grand conceptual ideas. Um, It'll help us keep going as a community, which is great. If I, I don't want to miss anybody. If there's anyone else that, okay, Boriana, the microphone is yours. <laughs> Boriana and I have been going to meetings for a long time together, so thank you. I have a question for Green and then I shall. 
So I was wondering, can you just give us a sense how bold are you going to be in your ideas for intersection re uh, reconfigurations? And is it just traffic lights and no left turns? Or are you going to go bigger? And if so, where is the funding coming from? Um, um, so I'll answer those few f uh, first questions. Uh, no, we are not um, really limiting ourselves to say put a light here everywhere. Um, I don't think that's the, the best idea. We try to look at it um, whichever area, whichever area it is. Maybe it's John Street, maybe it's Lakeview, uh, whichever it is. Come up with some ideas and then sort of take a step back and say, well, how does this impact the rest? Um, for example, I think um, I heard a lot from the community in the past. Okay, can we make General Way a left turn um, that's a, a available? right so what does that do to the rest of the neighborhood so that's kind of something we're incorporating and not just um, saying okay we're just gonna do a light everywhere so no we're trying to come up with so, so do you have a timeline when do you think we, you can share with the, the, the community um, I think we should be ready soon to meet with the town staff. Um, I like to kind of show to them um, and get their feedback, and then I think we then can open it up. So I don't have an exact timeline, but um, we are trying to move it. Um, and just to give you an idea, we started this in the summer, in the late summer, so and we are here now, um, almost ready to get to meet with the staff. So we are moving. Um. I just like to compliment everyone on reimagining and doing this because. You know, I think in all our towns, we have all these issues, you know, how do you handle seniors, how do you handle growth, and as the senator brought up, how do you get the additional housing that's needed? And uh, I mean, whatever happens on this, you're thinking, and that's key. Thank you. And I'll just wrap up by saying this is one of many opportunities for community engagement. Um, somebody said to us at another meeting, um, okay, what's the next step? The next step is to have a lot more of these kinds of meetings, and um, we call it the rubber chicken circuit. So we've had a couple of groups already approach us wanting us to come and talk to them about this, because the more we get a lot of a really good dialogue going about, you know, what things should we be thinking more about? About and where are some of the areas that we could, uh, um, you know, start? All those kinds of things are so important. And in planning, we always say we want to go slow to go fast. So we're going to go slow, and we're going to listen, and we're going to really be thoughtful in how we go forward on this. So with that, thank you again. I hope you stick around and give us your feedback. If not, you can absolutely feel free to go onto the website, send us emails. Um, we're happy to phone calls come to the counter, um, write us a note, whatever you think, we want to hear from you, and thank you again.